Today we're gonna talk about prose because I mention prose a lot when I talk about books. I don't know, I guess I'm a snob. I just, when prose are very meaningful and thoughtfully done and intentional, I just, I'm, I eat it up, I eat it up. And so I mention prose a lot when I'm talking about books, whether I like the prose or not, it's brought up a lot and I get a lot of comments, people asking me to make a dedicated video on prose. I put it off because I just don't see this being very interesting to a large group of people, but it's been requested enough that I am now going to discuss prose. My plan is to break down what the word prose means, to talk about beautiful prose, typical, standard, kind of bland prose, dry prose, purple prose, bad prose. I just want to kind of break down the different ranging uh, words that are often used and also give concrete examples from books in each category. This needs to be said right up front. I, it's obvious, but it still needs to be said. This is terribly subjective. While these words, words like purple prose, beautiful bro prose, boring prose, dry prose, all these things are used often, there is no hard and fast rule for any of it. But I do think that these words that we use are useful because they help us to articulate what we like, why we like them, and to give at least a general idea of what you're getting into. So if you happen to be a bit picky about prose, then somebody describing a book as having dry prose or purple prose, it could give you a pretty good idea up front if you're going to suffer reading this book, depending on what your interests are. So first of all, what is prose? Prose is most writing that you read. You have things written in verse and you have things written in prose. So poetry is typically written in verse. And then you have prose, which is how most novels and nonfiction and most things are written, which is, I mean, it's, pick up a book, it's probably prose. So when people describe prose, if prose is beautiful or boring or purple, they're describing the way an author is writing, the way they're describing things. I'll give examples. For me, when I say that a book has beautiful prose, I'm usually saying that the author isn't just describing what's in the scene, just point blank, there's a table in the room, the person's standing there, and they say some words. Usually what it means for me is that the author is cutting through what's right in front of them and describing beyond what's immediately needed to get the point across. Some examples of beautiful prose. She wasn't doing a thing that I could see except standing there, leaning on the balcony railing, holding the universe together. The pieces I am, she gathers them and gives them back to me, all in the right order. For a moment, the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward, breathlessly, as I listened. Then the glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret, like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. It's dark because you are trying too hard. Lightly try, child, lightly. Learn to do everything lightly, yes, Feel lightly, even though you are feeling deeply. Just lightly let things happen and lightly cope with them. Until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read. One does not love breathing. Words are pale shadows of forgotten names. As names have power, words have power. Words can light fires in the minds of men. Words can wring tears from the hardest hearts. So these quotes aren't describing what's directly in front of them. The girl is not holding the universe together. Uh, the person did not physically crumble and someone didn't walk up and, and put the pieces back together and hand it to them. The prose is describing something beyond what's immediately there. It's describing what's beyond uh, what's physically in the scene and it's describing the emotions that people are, in, are feeling. It's describing what they're going through and how they're interacting with the world in a more metaphorical way that directly relates to what's being discussed. For me, the reason I love this kind of writing is because 
obviously these authors are also going to describe a scene. When you walk into a room, they're going to describe what's in that room. When someone's feeling angry, they're going to say that person is feeling angry. But when this kind of prose is used, the, is used effectively, what it can oftentimes do is it can cut through the scene and, and bring you closer in to the emotions of the scene, to the feelings of what the characters are going through, and, and help you to feel it rather than just see it, to experience it rather than just be told about it. If you're interested in more quotes like this, I have a couple of videos dedicated just to great book quotes, and usually those are quotes like these because that's what I like. But I also want to mention for me when I talk about beautiful prose, it can it can look a lot of different ways. Um, Frederick Bachman is one of my favorite authors and Corey recently read Anxious People, which is one of my least favorite of his books, but we read it together. I didn't know it was going to be one of my least favorites. It was still great. And uh, Corey, this is the only Bachman book he's read, but while he was reading it, he was saying, it's like he's it's like he's punching me in the gut with some of the things that he says because it's not just what he's saying, it's how he's saying it that's cutting through the pages straight to me. And that's how I feel about Bachman a lot is he is discussing something but he's not just discussing it bluntly, he's usually discussing it in such a way that kind of just cuts through it all and and hits on a much more personal level. But I also want to hit on that beautiful prose can be effective in really dark Dark, painful scenes, in torture scenes, in uh, in scenes of terrible breakdowns. Um, Joe Abercrombie, who wrote the first Law trilogy and just several books over there, uh, as well as uh, Steven Erickson, who wrote the Malazan books. Only one book is right there. I'm currently reading book three, so I'm actually going to read you a couple quotes from book three without using names and without talking about very specific things. It's going to be spoiler-free, don't worry, but I'm currently reading it, so it's on my mind a lot. And Erickson and Abercrombie have this ability to write these devastating, dark scenes and, and to do it in a way that's so beautiful that it brings me in so much closer. Let me explain. This is a scene of a person being very upset. And so you would die now. Yes, I understand. A mother must not be led to hate the child she has birthed. Yet, you demand too much of yourself. She has stolen my life, she screamed, gnarled hands closing to fists from which the blood within them fled. The woman stared at those fists, eyes wide, as if they were seeing a stranger's hands skeletal and dead, there at the end of her thin arms. Oh, crone, she said softly, she has stolen my life. To me, the pain in this scene isn't described in some overdramatic way, but it's also not described completely directly. It cuts through the emotions in a really raw way. Another scene that is, has no dialogue is just describing what's happening around it, another Erickson scene. He lurched upright, swung around, and began walking. A lumpy, yielding ground was underfoot. He did not look down, simply pushed on. It was all around him now, savage and deadly, yet held back from him, unable to reclaim his soul. The poison howled. He could feel the fingers once more, still pressed against the broken throat of his friend. Yet, within his mind, he still walked, step by step, inexorbitantly pushed forward. This is the journey to my flesh. Who has done this for me? Why? It began to dim around him. He was almost home. He looked down to see what he knew he would see. He walked a carpet of corpses, his path through the poisoned horror, costly, so costly. I intentionally skipped over uh, names and stuff in that, but um, it could have been, it would have been so easy for this author to just say he walked over a pile of bodies, but instead what was described was the feeling of it. What was described was the, the horror of what was happening and, and the cost of what had gotten him to this moment. It draws you into the senses rather than just describing what's in front of you. He's walking over bodies. It describes the senses as well as the emotions, and to me, it's so haunting. <laughs> so those are some examples of what I would describe as beautiful prose that is speaking 
Personally, you may not like any of those examples that I gave, but the point is that beautiful prose usually is cutting through what's immediately in front of you and describing what's beneath the surface, what's deeper there, and usually in a nice, pretty way, even if it's horrifying. Now let's talk about purple prose. I have less examples for this one, but boy, do I have examples. Purple prose is similar to what I describe as beautiful prose, just on steroids. It's usually very embellished language. It's a little bit over the top. It's very symbolic. It's not even slightly describing what's immediately in front of you. It is primarily describing emotions and feelings and just this very lyrical, emotions-heavy, metaphorical, really just nothing in front of you is real. It's just all about yeah, I'll show you. I love you, I love you, I love you. I'll write it in waves, in skies, in my heart. You'll never see, but you will never know. I'll be like all the poets. I'll kill them all and take each one's place in turn. And every time love's written in all the strands, it will be to you. I want to be a body for you. I want to chase you, find you. I want to be eluded and teased and adored. I want to be defeated and victorious. I want you to cut me, sharpen me. I want to drink tea beside you in 10 years or a thousand. Flowers grow far away on a planet they'll call something. When the living star and its black hole binary enter conjunction, I want to fix you a bouquet of them gathered across 800,000 years so that you can draw our whole engagement in a single breath all the ages we've shaped together. <sighs> okay. I love you, I love you, and I love you on battlefields, in shadows, in fading ink, on cold ice splashed with the blood of seals, in the rings of trees, in the wreckage of a planet crumbling to space, in bubbling water, in bee stings and dragonfly wings, in stars, in the depths of lonely woods where I wandered in my youth, staring up. And even then, you watched me. You slid back through my my life, and I have known you since before I knew you. Hunger, read, to state a hunger or to stoke it, to feel hunger as a furnace, to trace its edges like teeth. Is this a thing, singly, no? Have you ever had a hunger that weddled itself on what you fed it, sharpened so keen and bright that it might slit you open, break a new thing out? Sometimes I think that's what I have instead of friends. Now imagine reading an entire book where things are described like this. Every time there's an emotion, every time somebody wants to describe something, it is described in this way. That's purple prose. Um, I have a friend who loves purple prose, Brittany. If you like them too, you should check out her channel because she's wonderful. Uh, she, I actually, the, every single quote that I, every single quote that I just read you was from This Is How You Lose a Time War. So if you, dig that. Here's a whole book of it. Um, this book was such a challenge for me to read. Oh, I struggled. But I mean, it was, I came out enjoying it, but the pain. I'm not a purple prose person, but my friend is. There's nothing wrong with liking this. It's not an inherently negative thing. It's a very, I think people who are more in touch with their emotions maybe like it more than me. Even though being calling prose purple is oftentimes used in a negative light, it's not an inherently negative thing. And again, a lot of people absolutely love it. So the goal here is just to give you an idea of what it means when someone tells you that pro that the prose in a book is purple so that you can hear that and then say yes or no or I don't care. It means nothing. I, it doesn't affect my enjoyment at all. Another very common phrase, another very common thing that people say is that a book has boring or average prose. Sanderson is a very well-known author that often gets this label. By me too. I say it. It's true. I love Sanderson books. I have a whole shelf dedicated, whoop, that way. I have a whole shelf dedicated to him. Uh, but yeah, I, I, love, I love beautiful prose and Sanderson is a very direct, straightforward writer. He describes what is in front of him in his prose, which is not a negative thing at all. A lot of people actually really love that. They don't need all the metaphors. They don't need to cut through the scene to the emotions, to what's deeper, to what's beneath. They just want to know what's in the scene so that they can read the story. And they love Sanderson for doing that. All right, I just flipped to a random page and I found one. Why not? They stood there for a few more minutes, watching the mist gather. Finally, Kelsier stood up straight, stretching. Well, for what it's worth, I'm glad you decided to join us. Vin shrugged. 
To tell you the truth, I'd kind of like to see one of those flowers for myself. He, he stood there for a few moments, watching the mist gather. Finally, Kelsier stood up straight, stretching. It would be very easy to add into that emotions, to talk about how the mist swirled together, talking about how they gathered and rippled apart, or even discussing the, the movement of the mist uh, in conjunction with how they're feeling. Maybe the mist uh, look empty to them after a scene where they talked about some very emotional stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it would be very easy to add frill to that, but he doesn't. He just, the mists are there, they're gathering, he looks at him, he stands up, he says something, now the scene's done. There's nothing wrong with this writing. There is nothing technical wrong with what I read, but I'm trying to tell you about some plain, here's what's in front of you writing, and then how it could be turned into something else. But that's not Sanderson's agenda and that's fine. Then there's also dry writing, which is uh, definitely m also more used in a negative light, and that's usually uh, describing things in uh, in a long way. Uh, a lot of times it's used for like classic sci-fis, um, but like describing something very wordily without giving a lot of descriptors, without giving any pomp or frill. It's just like, here's the thing, let me tell you about it. It's kind of like reading a textbook. Do you need examples for that? The last thing that I want to talk about here is bad prose, and this is obviously the one that is distinctly negative. Again, we're talking about subjectivity here, but usually whenever somebody describes prose as bad, uh, they're talking about sentence structure. Uh, they're talking about bad grammar, overly repetitive phrases. They're usually talking about very technical things, and a lot of people don't care about this at all. But if prose reads clunky, like if somebody says the prose is clunky, they're usually saying that the sentence structure is not, it's not put together cleanly. Um, I'll give some examples of some prose that I don't consider very good. Lyra got up, wincing as she got up. Did you need to say got up twice? Did you need to repeat that? Or could you have found a different way if you needed to clarify that she got up? Which you didn't. If you needed to clarify that, could you have maybe clarified it with something else? Or just said Lyra winced as she got up? It's just, it's repetitive, it's clunky. Stop talking, he yelled angrily, bawling his fists in rage. Not only is this melodramatic, but also you could just say, stop talking, he yelled, if you have nothing else to say. But instead, you feel like you need to say more, but you're not actually saying much more. He yelled, which indicates that he's angry, but you said he's angry, and then he balled up his fist in rage. More descriptions of angry. This is my own sentence that I made intentionally bad, so I don't feel bad digging into it really hard because it's mine. She watched him leave, unfazed but angered. This is contradictory. Is she unfazed or is she angered? That doesn't make sense. I changed into my brilliant new tunic, giving myself a happy twirl in it. Happy greens. I was entering the big leagues. After lunch and the birthday presents, blessedly, mom had mercy on me. No chores. Birthday treat. Off to the park we went. Trees and flowers and grass all in the middle of town. <laughs> So in this book, it is an eight-year-old happily describing things, <laughs> but the way that this author chose to have this eight-year-old, to depict this eight-year-old being a child throughout this entire daggum book, or at least throughout the part that she's eight, was just through just an excessive amount of exclamation points. So things that are repetitive or things that are contradictory or things that are just a lot, uh, these are things that oftentimes people will say, yeah, the prose isn't great in this book or and there's clunky prose. Just, I'm giving isolated examples, but imagine an entire book written with these repetitive or contradictory or exclamatory <laughs> phrases. Again, none of these things is exclusively bad except for the section talking about bad prose. But as far as like beautiful prose, dry prose, uh, boring prose, um, purple prose, all these categories, these sections that we talked about, even though boring and dry inherently sound negative, the truth is that having just very standard, straightforward prose, there's nothing wrong with that. Having dry prose, there's nothing wrong with that either. A lot of people really like dry prose. They're not looking for all the pomp and frill. They just want things described. So these words and phrases, while they are subjective, while there is no hard and fast line, and while I may describe something as having dry prose and the next person may say it didn't feel dry to me at all or I may say something's purple and the next person may say that didn't really come off purple sure it's a little bit 
elaborate, but it's not purple. You know, like we have different standards, so it is subjective. There are no hard and fast lines, and they are sometimes used with negative connotations. I do think that these terms are very helpful because some people couldn't care less about prose. They could read. In fact, in fact, um, Beneath the Dragon Eye Moons, which I quoted twice under the bad prose section, I really enjoyed that book even though the prose graded on me. And yet, when I said, the prose isn't great here, the friends that recommended it to me were like, what do you mean? I didn't notice this at all, because they don't care about it as much as I do. And that's great. So that's the thing, is that I think that these phrases, I think that these terms are really useful for communicating why we like what we like, or why we don't like what we like, and really useful for articulating to each other how a book is written so that the next person can hear that and say, oh, that doesn't bother me, or oh, that negative for you is actually a positive for me. It's great for communicating something, but it is heavily, heavily, heavily subjective. Anyway, I really hope this was somewhat helpful to somebody in the world, <laughs> but that is me describing some different categories of how people, or that is me explaining some different categories of how people often describe prose. If you are someone that hears people describing prose sometimes and says, I don't even know what you're talking about, I hope this gave you some information. Please feel free to add to it in the comments, add other descriptors that people use, explain them, give examples yourself if you would like, or come completely disagree with me in every category. It's also totally chill because this is so subjective. I post videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here, Tuesdays and Thursdays on the other channel, which is linked in the description. I'll see you again soon. Bye.